Yes, everyone, welcome back to Five. Stephen Alston, Joel Bayer today joining us from ESPN is Mark Ogden. Mark, thank you for joining us. Today we are talking about the perceived lack of activity around Manchester United in the transfer window. Mark, what's going on? Well, perceived, well, there is a lack of activity, isn't it? Because they haven't signed anyone yet. And in terms of people that have left, it's only players... Whoa, 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 whoa. Come, we signed a 16-year-old keeper from Stevenage, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you go. That's it. That, that's what all the focus is being on. Really you know, it, in, term, look, in terms of players that have gone, we all know that United need to move players out. There's a lot of players that, for want of a better phrase, are dead wood. Now, the only ones that have left so far are players that have come to the end of the contract. So they've not actually raised any any significant fund, or any funds by selling players like, let's be honest, people like Wan-Bissaka, Phil Jones, um, Pereira. Th these deals might happen, but I th I'd have thought by now, if you're Eric Ten Hag, you don't want to be coming back to training with those guys there because they're clearly not part of the plans. I mean, one Bissaka perhaps, but I, I don't think so. So you, you say proceed. Well, I think what you're kind of referring to is what's happening behind the scenes because obviously there's a lot of action behind the scenes and that's what fans don't see. But ultimately, if you're involved in player recruitment ins and outs, you're just on what happens, not what might be happening behind the scenes. So yes, I, I know for a fact that United are, are busy behind the scenes. They're trying to be more strategic and more selective than in the past but until they sign a player or get somebody out of the door it's just all noise isn't it and it's just it's it's the same as last year and the year before where these sagas only seem to happen with man united you know we shouldn't be using man city and liverpool as yardsticks right now because they are so far ahead but city have brought in harland they're going to get calvin phillips done liverpool have brought in nunez they brought a couple of young players to the future as well they've got sadio mani out the weeks ahead and my issue at united is that Eric Ten Hag needs to work with the players he's playing with next season. And they go away on tour a week on Friday and there's nothing happened yet. And it, the, these pre-season weeks are absolutely crucial in terms of getting players bedded in, getting the tactics sorted out, getting them fit, and also off the pitch as well. These players need to find houses, they need to find schools for the kids, the, the, the partners need to settle. They need to even learn, learn how to drive on the other side of the road. These little things that actually people forget about are really important because when the season starts in August, the players are on the road, you know, all the time. So that's why clubs like United need to be getting their business done quicker, just make to make people settle in quicker, like tactically settle in. But again, you know, we're heading to July and nothing's been done. I want to. I agree with that because Steve, I know you're going to come in with your counter. I, I know I can feel it already. But I, I reckon Man United are playing a dangerous game, Mark, because um, even if the likes of Steve don't really rate Jesus that much as a sign-in. Um, you know, before we came online, he said City won the league without a striker and they had one. Okay, great, funny. But I believe that, I believe that other clubs are really making moves. And if United are not careful, I mean, they, they already finished, what, what was it, six, seven? Anyway, so, so it, you, they, they, they could end up in the same position just because... You know, like they're playing, they're playing. They, you need to get your team clicking and playing together. Yes, yesterday was probably the first time that Ten Hag had his team in training, etc. But he's been watching players and identifying players that he would have needed for a long time. I really think that you know, with the likes of Newcastle, the likes of Spurs, the likes of Arsenal, all these other teams that are actually active in the transfer market, you're going to fall behind if you keep playing games. Go on, Steve. Every team you've just mentioned there has had a manager in situ for years or in the Tottenham case, months, right? They've been working with the team. They know what they need to get rid of. They know what they need to keep and they know what positions they want to strengthen in. Eric Ten Hag, yes, he might have been watching us, but he's had a ton of players out on loan that might feature in his plans and that includes the likes of Danny van der Beek, let alone the youngsters that have been out on loan. And he's probably got a far more limited budget when it comes to signing players than we think. So I think that Frankie de Jong looks like he's all but sealed and, and that's going to happen by, by everyone's accounts. And I think it was pivotal to bringing in everybody else because if he didn't get Frankie de Jong, he had to then go and identify who would be the other key signing that's going to do exactly what I know Frankie can do because I've worked with him in the middle of the park. And that might eat up a greater or lesser amount of his budget. And that's going to have a knock-on effect. There isn't an unlimited money well that he's going to be going from here. There's probably a, a rough set figure that he's going to have to work to. And I think getting Frankie in means, okay, that one crossed off, move on to the next. I'm sure they're working on targets. And as Mark mentioned, that there's a lot of activity going on behind the scenes. But being very, very real, yesterday was the first time that he saw all of these players in the flesh. 
Some of them need a second chance. Some of them he might not have made his mind up on video. Some of them he's not even seen on video because they haven't played. So I think that giving him a little bit of a chance to judge, yes, there's players that we know are definitely going to be Deadwood and definitely going to be surplus to requirements. There's not 30 of them. There might be four or five. I think I think on that, I think, yeah, on De Jong, let's, let, let's talk about De Jong. I think the, the issue I've got with De Jong is the length of time it's taking because they're pushing an open door with De Jong. They know that Barca have to sell, they need to sell. Now, De Jong might need a bit of convincing that United's the place to go to because they're not in the Champions League. They might have a couple of years at least of transition, but that really is a case of Barca know what they need to do. United know what Barca need to do, just get it done. And that would give Ten Hag an instant lift. Certainly, I mean, what's it now been, five or six weeks since he was confirmed as manager? I th and I think I know that he had meetings with John Murta and Darren Fletcher in the week of the Champions League final, which obviously United were involved in. So that's four or five weeks away. He said, I want these players in, I want that player out. That, that's a month. A month is just gone and wasted without anything happening. So, yes, he might need to go and have a look at what Phil Jones can do, Pereira can do, but I, does he really? Now, I don't listen. This is a different scenario to David Moyes, but I want to draw a comparison to Moyes because when Moyes came in, he wanted to give everyone a chance, he wanted to look at the squad and see what... Moyes had managed Everton for 11 years. He knew exactly what he was walking into, but that that delay and that dither in that first four weeks, it just put everything back. Ten Hag has been employed as a guy that knows knows the game, he's a great coach. He, should, he will know which players he wants to go and which players he wants to bring in. And I, I do think that, you know, I, Stephen, I think you're right. I think it's good to be patient and give United the benefit of the doubt at times, but it's nearly July and something should have happened by now. Something should have... Somebody should have gone, somebody should have come in just to just to show that sign of progress that things are being done differently. Because as it stands right now, this looks like United are heading for another summer of, you know, things taking too long. And it is the time they waste at this part of the season. It's crucial during the season. But is it not better to, to get it right rather than rush in and make wrong signings, a la Sanchez and some of the other mistakes that we've made in the past, expensive mistakes that we've made in the past? We've spent a billion post Fergie and it ain't on the pitch. Absolutely, you know, no, most absolutely. of that money isn't at the club or on the pitch. Yeah, and I do know that one of the issues that, that they have been trying to address is that agents want in too high wages for the players and, you know, too high fees and, and that that's, that kind of thing. But, you know, United have to be a bit more, you know, cautious in the market. But I think there's a danger that you go from one extreme to the other, whereby under Woodward they were too, too often happy to pay big agent fees and overpriced fees for players when they didn't need to. Now, I think if, if they're being overcautious, they're going to miss out on players. And now, I don't think they miss out on De Jong because I think there's, He's a great player, but there's no market for him because the clubs that would ordinarily want to sign him have got different targets or they haven't got the money to sign him. So, you know, City brought in Phillips because they wanted a number six. They didn't want a player like De Jong. Liverpool are looking at Bellingham for next year, so they're not looking for De Jong. And then, obviously, he ain't going to go to Real Madrid. Bayern Munich don't need him. So the market for Frankie De Jong is limited, and I think that's why it's a deal that could easily be done. One thing I say in United's defence is that I, I've been told that they found it quite difficult to deal with Barcelona in the sense that They've been told one thing by, by Barcelona for their consumption, but obviously Barca have a very kind of political fan base and local press where they have to make sure the message to them is is, is suits that the audience. So they're having to give two different stories. So United are wondering which one's the real story, whether it's the one that they're being told or the one that the fans are being told. So again, you know, this is two big clubs, two massive clubs that have fallen hard times relative to their history. And it's just become a bit of a, a bit of an ego competition that one doesn't want to be outdone by the other. Man, I, I, my question is, though, how far are they when it comes to their other signings? The likes of Timbar, uh, I'm hearing Martinez could be an option. Um, how far are they from these signings? We're talking about how they've had a slow start, but how far are they from wrapping up these deals? I don't want to include the, uh, the young because I think that's wrapped up as well. But in regards to Timbar, how, how's that looking? Yeah, I, I think Timbar's just the way that he was talking recently about Lou Van Hal saying that if you've got a Man United, you're not going to play in the World Cup. I think that's, that's kind of worried him a little bit in terms of the World Cup. So I don't think that that'll happen unless he has a change of heart. I don't think that's a, an Ajax thing. That's a that's a player thing, a player concerned about his place in the World Cup squad. And that that is a, that is an unusual, that's a kind of a unique scenario this summer that usually a World Cup's a summer thing and the players get out of the way. A lot of players are now thinking about December, November, December. So, you know, you wouldn't want to sign a player that's totally focused on the World Cup. So I think that's probably one that United need to swerve. In terms of Anthony, it's a player, it's a deal that can get done. If he wants to move, Ajax will sell. Ajax do sell players when it needs to be done. But again, I don't think Ten Hag, first of all, wants his first sign to be an Ajax player, but also I don't think he wants to add an attacking player as his first sign because 
although every every department at Old Trafford needs strengthening, I think the attacking department is probably better stocked than others. The priority, I've been told, 100% is midfield. So when they were when they were linked with Darwin Nunes, the reason why they didn't push hard for that was, one, because they felt the price was too high, and two, because their issue, their focus right now is midfield. So that's why De Jong is such a big deal. Ericsson, Christian Ericsson, again, that's a deal that I think can be done, but I think what's holding that up is that Ericsson looks at it, he's, you know, again, he's a unique scenario. They, the guy, you know, to, to actually still be alive after what happened last year is, is an amazing thing. The fact that he's playing football again, he's just off the scale. So he wants to play. He's playing at Brentford. If he goes to Man United, he, he's probably, he's thinking, you know, I want to be convinced that I'm going to play a game. And how often will he play with, you know, Bruno Fernandes around, with Frankie de Jong around, you know, with, you've got Ronaldo, Sancho, Rashford, Martial, Alanga. I just think he needs to be convinced that he goes to Man United and he plays. So that's what's holding that deal up. And as for the others, it is just a case of the young is the is a kind of the keystone to it. Get that in, then things can happen. Then they can start moving players out. They need a right back. You could argue they need a left back as well. I mean, they need a lot of players, but the young is the key. And once that happens, then it will kind of, I think, grease the wheels to get the other ones done. Tony Marshall, has he uh, got a future at the club? He's got a future because of by default, I guess. I think obviously he had a he's had a poor. 18 months, two years at United now. He didn't do anything severe, but because United have accepted the need, you know, Ralph Ranić did point out the obvious that they need a centre forward because obviously Ronaldo's 37, Cavani's gone. But because they haven't identified one that can do the job, then Martial will probably have to stay because he's a proven Premier League forward if if one that's kind of very much, you know, one in five, I guess. I mean, that's, that's his kind of consistency rating. But I think... There's a player there somewhere and Ten Hag thinks he can get something out of him. And they're going to have to because if you let Martial go, you have to get a centre-forward in. And there's not really a great wealth of centre-forwards out there at the moment. City have got the best in Haaland. You know, Lewandowski will probably go to Barcelona. But, you know, if United sign Lewandowski, having signed Ronaldo, they'll be like, well, you're signing another player that's in his mid-30s. So, you know, Liverpool have signed Nunes. And then beyond that, I think you're talking about players that aren't really proven. I think they'd love Harry Kane. But, you know, Harry Kane, first of all, why would they leave Tottenham right now? They're in the Champions League. And why would they go to Man United? Man United are six. They're again in transition. He wants to win trophies. He's 29 soon. So you don't go to Man United to win trophies right now if you're a team in the Champions League. So I think that the field of candidates available is so, well, first of all, so difficult to attract in the case of Haaland, Nunes, Lewandowski. And secondly, you know, Martial will have to stay because of necessity. And it's not ideal that you keep in place because the least worst option but that's what it is with Martial right now that keeping is better than letting him go and having a hole in your options um, In regards to frustration would you say Ten Hag is frustrated at the moment from what you believe? He always looks frustrated but then he's probably like me people think I always look frustrated and mad and angry because I've got a miserable face but I think Ten Hag is one of those, one of those guys that just looks intense um, so Listen, he'll be having conversations every day with people at United. He'll know what's going on. And if there's a frustration there, I don't think he'll wait too long to express it because the one thing we get about Dutch people in football, they're pretty quick to tell it as it is. So I think if by the time they get to Bangkok on the first leg of the tour in Thailand, if nothing's happened by then, I think his, his frustrations will become clear. But I think right now he knows what's going on. I think he's keeping a lid on it, but... Give it a week or two, and I think if nothing's happened by then, I think we'll know he's frustrated. Steve, what more can you say on that? Like, this is what I mean. You got to cut your cloth accordingly. That you can't just bin ten players and sign ten players in one window. It's not realistic. And I, I actually think the amount of movement that's gone on in the boardroom is probably reflective of a little bit of a slower movement. And it's not just boardroom level stuff. Obviously, like said, Jim Lawler and Marcel Boot moving on. That's the head of scouting and recruitment. So you've had to bring new people in. You know, Have they had to recompile reports? Have they had to... United are hiring analysts at the moment. You can go and look on LinkedIn. The, the, the adverts are out there. Are they looking at recruitment analysts? Have they not got recruitment analysts in at the moment? We, you know, It's not public information what they currently have working at the club, is it? So there could be all of these things kind of slowing things down and... It's not an excuse for it. It's a mitigating factor of some things. But I'm not panicking just yet. If it gets to the tour and it doesn't look like anyone's coming in, yeah, I mean, that isn't far away. It's, you know, it's a, a fortnight away. 
if it looks at that point then, mm, there's, there's not really a lot of movement here. But we've done deals early doors in the past and they've bombed and we've done, you know, wasn't Van Persie signed like two days before our first game of the season? He did all right. Like, I think it's it's ideal that you get him in as early as possible, but it's a long season with all sorts of carnage going on in the middle of it. And I'd rather get the right people in um, than rush and get the wrong people in. I mean, you've got I think, a big start uh, this season, though. Uh, you know, Steve, sorry, Mark, to interrupt. So, but United have got a big start, man. You've got big games, so you don't want to be dropping too many points. I think one issue that United always have is that the, the kind of the Man United tax, whenever they go for a player, that because it's Man United, they're, they're ordinarily, you know, charged, expect to pay more in terms of fees and wages because they are, you know, one of the wealthiest clubs in the world. But, you know, Man City are in the same boat and they get deals done quick, more quickly. And I think to, to Steve's point, in terms of, the upheaval at United behind the scenes. You know, Man City have been a model of absolute stability and consistency for 10, 12 years now. I think I think you're getting on for maybe eight, nine years since Chiki Baguristan went in as director of football, then Soriano came in. You know, everything at City just works. You know, they can do it with their eyes closed. It's almost like United were back in the early 2000s when everything just got done because they were so slick and accomplished. And United appear to be in a state of flux for nearly 10 years now. And yes, they are looking for analysts, and they have got a, you know they've got a decent stock of analysts and scouts. But sometimes I think United can overdo it. I mean, we we all never forget the Ed Woodward thing about eight hundred and four right backs, and having one Basaka was decided to be the best on that. You don't need to look at eight hundred and four right backs. You just need somebody at the club who's got an eye for talent. who will say, right, the best three or four right backs in the world right now are these, and we'll get one of them. Eight hundred and four. That's just that's just a waste of time and energy. So streamline your recruitment policy, don't overdo it with analysts. You can have too many scouts and too many eyes. You can, you just need some somebody who's decisive and comes to the chase. And that, again, that has been what's been the problem for United in the past. They've just got bogged down with detail. We all know the best players are. You know, we all know which players are good enough for Man United and which ones aren't. And there's, unfortunately right now, the majority of the players at United aren't good enough, but they've been brought in by people who've been regarded as data analysts and scouts who think that they're the best players around. Before Akimi went to Inter, um, he sat down with Matt Judge um, at um, our Mayfair office. Um, he'd just been for a tour around Tottenham with Pochettino as well. If we was looking at bringing him in, I don't know how we decided on bringing Wamba Sakura. You know, no, I don't that, understand that how for the same sort of money, you look at those two and think they're comparable in terms of ability. Well, this Even is it. This is the, absolutely. And this is the problem, isn't it? You know, the, the brains trust at the time they shouldn't involve Matt Judge. He's, he's a numbers man. He's a he's a he's a financier. He shouldn't, you know, and I I know from you know people have said that have been involved with Matt Judge that he was very much a, an accountant by heart and it, everything was you know ground ground down to the finest detail and that that put people off. But you shouldn't be losing players like Akimi because even at Real Madrid people knew that he was going to be a star and he went to PSG and he's proven that. And I, I just think the problem at United has been that there's been there's not been enough football people with an eye for talent and a, you know a, a knowledge of the game making decisions it's been it's been people that have been brought in because you know the the, the data specialists or the, the, they have the wrong skill set to identify players and i think that has been wan is is an example of that now man united at the time needed a a, a fullback who could who could attack could distribute the ball and they signed wan bisaka who can't do any of those he said, you know, he'd come from Crystal Palace where he'd spent the majority of his time defending and he's a good defender one-on-one, -on -one, but that's basically it. He's a good one-on-one -on -one defender, but concentration levels are poor. We've seen so many times when he couldn't defend the far post with crosses coming in, goals conceded because of that. He can't pass the ball. What on earth were they looking at when they signed Wan-Bissaka? It, it just wasn't good enough. And again, that for me is, is an example of the, the lack of quality talent they've got behind the scenes and they might be trying to address that but I, can't, I mean I've been doing this job for a long time now and I, every year since Ferguson left it's been oh we're changing this we're changing that cultural reboot cultural reset do this do that it's nine years now and they're still changing things Jesus I mean how long has the transitional period taken Man United you know Barca went into transition last summer it took six months and they're kind of coming out of it now because so oh, God almighty I, I think Richard Arnold is a, is a better fit I've got to say I think is a different character to Woodward. Yes, they come from the same cloth, they're, you know, they're, they're from the same university, the 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 mates, they work for the Glazers, but they're different people. And from what I've been told is Richard Arnold is a bit is very much more focused on the job. He's less interested in being the guy that takes the glory for 
getting deals done. He he will sit as the boss. He's appointing people in positions to do the job. They have to report to him. And he's letting people get on with the job. I don't think Edward would did that often enough, if at all. I think, you know, Ed was always happy to take credit for when they signed Ronaldo or gave Wayne Rooney a new deal. But when the deals went wrong, it was somebody else's fault. I think now we've got a much more clear line of responsibility, accountability, and that ultimately would be a good thing because people have to get it right and not just, you know, hide behind the chief exec. James Garner, we've got problems in midfield. He had a fantastic couple of loan spells at Nottingham Forest in the Championship. Is it too soon or do you think he'll be given an opportunity over pre-season to see if he can fill that void? Well, I think both. I think it is too soon, but I think he will be given an opportunity pre-season. And I've seen enough pre-season campaigns to know that if you base your, your judgment on pre-season, that Kiko Makeda would still be there and so and Andreas Pereira would probably be captain by now. So <laughs> you, you can't base anything on, on cap. I, I remember every every summer tour for about four years, we'd, we'd, we'd go to the first game and Makeda would score three goals or something, have a great game. And he'd come out and say, this is my year, before he went on loan to some crap team somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So I think with Garner... I think he's had a couple of good years in the championship, but it's the championship and it's a massive, massive difference to the Premier League. And I think, you know, you look at, I think if a player goes on loan to the championship or League One, are they really cut out to be a Premier League player? Man City don't loan the players out to that level and they don't come back. I think they're either a Premier League player or they're not. And I, I think you've got to give Garner a chance. I think you've got to give him the opportunity. I wouldn't loan him out. I'd, give him, I'd certainly give him the first half of the season, but... I'm not sure, you know. I think by now, he, if he was that, if he was good enough, he'd be playing. You know, look at McTominay. Is he good enough? Probably not, but he's 25 now and he's still there. So, I don't know. I think it's, I'm not sure about United's young players at the moment. I don't think they're anything like they used to be 20 years ago. So, people get the hopes up, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that he's, he's going to be cut out for it. He might end up being sold six months' time, 12 months' time as being not good enough. You don't have to raise the standards, they have to raise the bar. They should be looking at players that are world-class players or about to world-class players. I don't think Garner's in that level. So, just to wrap it up, I was going to ask, if you were obvious, if you were to look at where you believe United will be finishing this season, what would you say? Well, I think the top two is gone. I think City and Liverpool are still so far ahead that you, you can forget about the top two. And I, If I was United, I'd be worried about Tottenham because they've got a good manager, top manager, they're keeping Kane and Son. Um, they've added Perisic, who's a good signing. Basuma's a good sign. So I think Tottenham, for me, have already got third pretty much nailed down. I think Chelsea have got a few problems. They've got, you know, players have left. They've got issues with replacing. You know, obviously, Rudiger's gone. Lukaku's gone back to Inter. They've got a lot of players that need replacing. The takeover's put them back quite a lot this summer. You know, they're clearing out the... Again, they're clearing out the brains to us. I did a piece last week saying that Chelsea letting Marina Gronovskaya go is a bit like when David Gill left Man United, that it could be a big a big blow to Chelsea in the sense that they have the people that are coming in aren't as equipped to deal with it. So Chelsea, I think, have got problems. I think Chelsea could be vulnerable. And we never know with Arsenal. Arsenal are quite flaky. They always have been. So for me, I think United are in a race with Chelsea and Arsenal for fourth. And as it stands right now, I'd say Chelsea are favourites for fourth just because of the, the team they've already got. But if United do some good recruitment and Ten Hag gets more out of the players, which he should, he can't get any less than Solskjaer and, Ten, and Ranyard, can he? So I think United are probably aiming for fourth. Um, but it's, it is going to be tough. I think we could improve and finish fifth. <laughs> well, yeah. I think we could drastically improve and finish fifth. Because I, I yeah, agree I mean, with what you said about Tottenham and uh, I think Chelsea's squad, Chelsea have gone through loads of managerial changes in the last 20 years, but the depth and strength of the squad has always sort of carried them to relative success. So I, I think they'll probably, I think they're a club set up to just be in transition and, and deal with it, I think. It's a different Chelsea now, I think, because obviously Abramovich did, did kind of bail them out a lot over the years in terms of his, you know, I think... I think it kind of averaged out at 70 million a year that you kind of helped subsidise their kind of losses. So it's a different Chelsea now. They're going to, the American owners, as we know, kind of are very different to wealthy owners. That I think only Liverpool's owners have actually made a success of it. But you know, the Glazers, the guys at Arsenal, if if, if Todd Bowley's group are going to be like that, then I think Chelsea are going to have a different, a very different future. So I like Kai Havertz. I think he's a great player. But you, you look at Chelsea right now, they haven't got a goal scorer. You know, Timo Werner can't score. Lukaku's gone. So, 
at least United have got one in Ronaldo. So I think that gives United an edge. But no, I think the one thing I'll say about United is that they, 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 seriously, they can't be any worse than last year. I think Ten Hag will get more out of the players. And I think one thing that the players that I, I got from speaking to people involved last year was that the players are so fed up of being coached poorly by Solskjaer and then by Ranjit. They didn't know what they were doing. They, were, they weren't given the same sort of tactical knowledge that they get at Liverpool, at Chelsea, at Man City. So I think Ten Hag comes in, he make he should make them all better. I can't think of a United player that's improved anywhere the last three years, at least, or maybe the last nine years. But uh, but Ten Hag has that in him. So if you can get more out of Rashford, more out of Martial, more out of Alanga, more out of Fred, you know, all of a sudden you get, you, if it's if all the players improve by 5 or 10%, that's a big improvement. So maybe that optimism should be there because, you know, Ronaldo is a problem that needs, is it, is a great problem to have because he scores goals. But I, I agree that he might not fit in with the the Ten Hag way of playing, but the guy scores goals and he scored a lot of big goals last year, important goals, but he ain't going to play or score against Liverpool, Chelsea, Man City. He didn't play any away games against those teams last season. So you have to kind of write him off and for those games, but he'll, he'll score a lot of goals against the weaker team. So you just need people like Rashford to do more, get back to what he was, Sancho to do more. You know, if, if United forwards have a good year this year, Martial, Rashford, and Sancho—they've got great talent. You know, they, they could—they could quite easily score fifty goals between them, plus Ronaldo. So it might not be that bad. I, I just think you need to address the midfield, and if the midfield's better, the defense will be better. So, you know, let's look on the bright side, eh? Mm, that's good to hear, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you know, we really appreciate it, and uh, I think you've given Steve some new insight. Ain't that right, Steve? All I could hear is uh, you, you peaked again, Arsenal, and it's all downhill from here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did. But guys, please make sure that you follow Mark Ogden uh, on socials. Go check him out. And also, please check out ESPN. Uh, we're working with a few journalists, and we're really happy to have you on, Mark. And I'm sure we'll be speaking to you again very, very soon. I love the honesty. And yeah, we will be back soon on 5, giving you updates. Peace.